team, thanks for uh, uh, letting me present, or, or I want to extend my appreciation to the group for uh, missing out on last week. Kevin, uh, great job in, in extending the conversation. Shane, thanks for your uh, uh, welcome to the team, and, and thanks for your input as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick, and what we're going to talk about today is going to be all about theming uh, or, or, or CSS, HTML, um, kind of the look and feel of the Shiny app as a whole. Now, what I found in presenting this material, and this is all before uh, uh, everyone was joining, uh, I had made a statement that during this chapter, I realized there's more here than is, is you know, to be put in text. Uh, there's a lot of things that were left out in this particular chapter that almost present a cornerstone of comprehension to even really understand what is happening when you call the Shiny app itself. And where I'm going with this subject is, is SGML. So when you look at uh, uh, standardized, uh, oh, I wrote that word down. Give me one second, sorry. I don't wanna sound foolish when I make that comment. Uh, let's just go to the link. So I make sure it's standardized general markup language, I think if I'm saying the acronym correctly. Uh, SGML was the beginning of a lot of this content. And what uh, standardized generalized, standard generalized markup language, where this comes into play, all right, when we talk about HTML, hypertext markup language, when we talk about markdown documents, uh, when you're uh, experiencing XML, right, or maybe even JSON files, uh, that's kind of a stretch, but what you're dealing, uh, YAML files, yet another markup language, when you're dealing with these different file extensions, it's the style and format, and, and, and it has to do with a schema, or it has to do with this uh, tagging process, and, and it, it's a reflection of the Darwin uh, uh, documentation protocol. Uh, each point has a uh, hierarchical approach of how it is applied in the document. Okay, now, how does this apply to Shiny? Well, Within the RStudio language, Shiny is an ability to transpose or to compile uh, into another language. So you write your R script, your, your Shiny script, your UI and a user interface in your server. And then when you run the app, what is happening is it, it takes that R code and then produces a web server. Okay, now in, in past, uh, uh, past exchange a couple of sessions ago, um, I was talking about Ruby servers or uh, Python servers or uh, 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 Node.js servers. All of these are rela uh, re related to the same activity that is Shiny. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm attempting to at least make the team aware that this is a really, really, really deep subject. There's a lot of depth and you can get lost in where you're going. So I will... Uh, share a quick quote, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. When we look at theming and layout and, and, and uh, the look and feel of your app, you can really get lost quickly, okay? Uh, uh, almost to a point of like, I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours until I find the right color code to make this little widget, you know, do what I want it to do. Um, don't get lost in the weeds, Right. Get your app running and then start worrying about the look and feel or the theming of this process. So I'm going to go back to the chapter and we'll start from there. So in the chapter, you'll unlock new features for controlling the overall appearance of the app. Uh, the second section here is single page layouts. Uh, and by the way, team, uh, I had mentioned to Colin uh, over communication before the apps or before the session started. I am going to have this one area where my R studio may crash. Uh, so I'm giving heads up now that I, I'm gonna spend a couple of moments to spin that back up again. But uh, I didn't actually produce any form of, of uh, uh, presentation media uh, because most of this chapter is going to be related to literally interacting with things outside of R, okay? So single page layouts, uh, we have what they call the fluid page. And this uh, one, excuse me, I guess that's linked. Uh, the fluid page itself is calling on a bootstrap uh, framework. So when I was mentioning the uh, transposing from R code through Shiny and then into a web server, this fluid page or this bootstrap 
allows you to build the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript calls based on the Bootstrap library. Okay, well, Bootstrap was built for Twitter. It's went through, I don't know, five or six different iterations. Uh, and so as we as we start to discuss what is Bootstrap, how does how do you apply Bootstrap? It's going to be part of the later chapter. The reason I'm making this statement is try to keep it simple. Try to keep uh, try to maintain some level of order and discipline to your application so you can feel confident in running the app. After that, you're going to start getting these more eloquent ways of, of kind of appearance, right? Uh, uh, every walk of life makes the world go round kind of concept. Everyone's going to have their own uh, pleasing effect of, of a web service, right? So fluid page is the first focus here. And, and again, if I'm talking in that SGML or that Darwin architecture, uh, uh, parent child type hierarchical format, you can even see that in the tabbing of what's happening with these calls. So we call fluid page first, that's going to give us our page layout. Now we're going to give it a title page. Well, the title page is going to show up in the top uh, left corner of your page, right? Well, not necessarily, you can move this around as needed, but that's going to get into that theming process. Uh, the sidebar layout and the sidebar panel uh, is a child of the bar layout. So we're going to see that that's going to be on the left hand side and we can add additional widgets, uh, sliders, text entries, um, etc. Okay. Finally, we get to the very end where we have our main panel. Now the main panel is the center of the stage. All right. So the, the, the main panel is where you're going to plot uh, or where you're going to present most of your media at. All of your side panels, whether they be on the right or the left hand side, are kind of interactive widgets. They're affecting that main plot. Okay, so let's keep going down here. Um, so we're talking about page functions. Uh, most important, but least interesting, is the fluid page itself. So I've already spent a little bit of time uh, discussing that. There are other, there's two other uh, services that also fit into that fluid page layout, uh, and that would be the fixed page or the fill page. Well, fixed is if we're going to be uh, statically uh, presenting our media regardless of the window of opportunity that we're uh, uh, viewing the content. If it's a tablet, if it's a cell phone, if it's your desktop environment, if we use a, a uh, fixed page, we're giving it a pixel layout, we, we are going to uh, uh, only render it within that uh, uh, static value, right? If we go fill page, that's gonna take up the entire uh, screen itself, right? Um, fluid page and uh, fill page uh, aren't, uh, they are different from each other, but uh, in their activity of how they're presented, um, we can kind of almost think of them as the same. All right. So now we talk about the uh, page with sidebar. Um, Colin, I had you in mind when I spent about, oh, I would say 30 minutes uh, trying to recreate this image. All right. So hear me out and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why this is important. Um, when we look at the fluid page, that is the overarching web page itself, right? Depending on the screen resolution that we're dealing with. So your fluid page is going to take up uh, all four uh, dimensions or the maximum dimensions. The title page or our title panel, that's going to be across the top. And then as we look at the sidebar layout, that's going to give us an object where we can place our widgets. Okay. Inside the side, uh, sidebar layout would be that sidebar panel. You can have these as uh, separate entities. So I'm not going to open the, the, uh, the uh, drawing that I made. I'm going to actually take you to a web page that will show you where I'm going with this. I found this application guide layout. It's a shiny, uh, shiny studio um, forum post. Uh, but what I liked about this particular page, and I'm going to zoom in right here. So let's go command increase size here. Okay. During the exercise of this first initial chapter, it asks the user uh, place this sidebar, you know, in the bottom of your page, or, or uh, change it from the left and put it on the right instead. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, we have to actually tell the document object model where to put that particular object. Okay, so uh, in your mind's eye, when you're dealing in a cascading style sheet or in an HTML page, really it's CSS that does this or Bootstrap that does this, think of it as a grid. Think of the web page as a grid. 
in the fluid page or the bootstrap uh, framework, you have 12 columns. They always have to equal 12. So if I dedicate two of those columns to my sidebar widget, that means my main panel has eight uh, 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 columns that it can take up, right? So again, the, the, the size of your screen is irrelevant, right? The pixel count of your, your height and, and, and width is, is irrelevant. You're still gonna get that 12 column layout, okay? And I liked this particular image and that's why I'm taking the team to this page is if you count these up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, my main panel on this particular point is a grid of eight columns. Below that, I'm creating another row, right? Again, it's just like a table. I'm creating another row, but that row has three different columns to it, right? Um, we've probably all had some experience with Google Sheets with possibly, uh, I don't know what they call that in Mac, the, uh, the uh, grid layout, uh, not grid layout, the uh, Excel. Uh, Excel is in Microsoft. I can't think of what that program is called in, in uh, Mac, but we've all probably dealt with spreadsheets in our, in our past experience. And we know that we can merge cells back and forth. So imagine that you've got uh, 12 columns and an indefinite amount of rows. You want to split those out, but they always must equal 12. So the exercise that the uh, uh, book is asking us to do is to modify or change that layout. Well, we're just gonna tell it, I want you to be over on columns 11 and 12, and I'm gonna make my main panel on columns one through 10, we'll say. Understand how I did that? Everything has to equal 12, okay? All right, uh, the last point here, and, and what, uh, what is hard to find because it doesn't call it out directly in the book, uh, this is called a well. Um, it's at the bottom of the page, so. All right, let's go back to our chapter layout. Um, Colin, when I was trying to create this image, um, I was attempting the exact same uh, font style and rounded corners, kind of replicating what the book was doing. And uh, it, it took me quite a while, um, all the various different objects as they were layered together. Okay. All right, let's keep going down the list. So Ryan, right, so we're gonna... Oh, yeah, so ahead, I sir. just have a quick question. So when we talk yeah. about the when we talk about the grid system, mm -hmm. that's that's a convention or a standard set by Bootstrap, correct? That's correct. Or yes, is that, that just is web? Okay, I just wanted to just double check my understanding. Um, there's a infinite amount of different. Um, um, we'll call them. What's the word? Bootstrap is 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 one application. I've dealt with Mustache in the past, or Handlebars is another framework. Um, Stash uh, is, is is Mustache. It's part of the Handlebars uh, application. But um, all of these, uh, Colin, the way you want to think about them is you've got a a you know a, a tic tac toe or a battleship type grid, right? A, a coordinate system on your screen, and what your tasked to do, if that's image size, if that's, you know, object placement, container placement, we're going to find here in a moment, we'll start talking about div tags in a second. What you're doing is allocating that resource to that specific point on the page. So no matter what browser you're approaching it with, it will always show up in the top left corner, right? Or your image will always show up in the bottom right corner. Um, there's a, a real school of thought to the to the background, and it's 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 so simple arithmetic. So when I mentioned the 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 grid system of twelve columns, um, that is uh, specifically Bootstrap's uh, method of placing these objects in different locations on the screen. Um, have you? Everyone here has probably heard a commercial or watched on YouTube or or possibly on TV uh, like Squarespace. Uh, or uh, what's another one? There's, uh, is it Wix? Wix is another uh, web development system. Um, maybe if you're old enough and you remember MySpace and just old school HTML, the reason these are important is because it, it kind of uh, harbors to that uh, thought process of this gridding type application. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, uh, kind of hacks within HTML if you want um, your information to spread across in an even form on a web page, you put it inside a table. 
well, but it's not really a table. It's just a container of where your content is living on the page. Um, but when you look at the HTML code that creates it, it's actually a, a table call. You've got table headers and table rows, et cetera. And then inside there, you place your content. Has anybody had any experience with web development in the past? Shane, I'm kind of driving it yourself. Uh, you asked a question about the DOM tree. Um, yeah, only to the extent of what I've had to do. So like my main area of like expertise is digital and like web analytics. So okay. as you get deeper into that, you obviously have to learn basically like DOM tree structure and knowing what you're going to target with like yes. Google Tag Manager or stuff like that. So to the extent that I've had to pester the devs and learn like what I'm looking at, just using like developer tools and stuff. Yeah, but beyond that, I'm, you know, like frameworks and, and um, like getting real into JavaScript and stuff. I'm not on that level or anything, but the basic understanding is, is what I've been exposed to. I, I keyed in on your statement about the, the DOM tree uh, last session. I, I was really excited to, to see you uh, this week and, and, and kind of, um, I don't know, get a conversation going about that subject. Cause here in a moment, I'm going to, I'm going to open up the page and I'll, I'll actually go to dev tools and show you the document tree. Okay. And yeah, um, like see, like seeing how this is laid out too. And just the book mentions, you know, getting your bearings by looking at like your indentation and seeing how things are in this hierarchy, like immediately just made me think of how a DOM tree is structured and it sort of clicked right away. And it's, well, it makes it a lot easier to follow along. So in common web servers, and, and again, uh, uh, Colin and, and Ryan, I don't want to take the team too far off the beaten path from R, but I, I do want to at least provide you a pathway that there is a larger structure behind what's going on in Shiny and in just web development, period. A good example is if you were to develop a LAMP stack, right? LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, you could also have a LIMP stack, which is uh, uh, Linux, uh, Linux, Nginx, MySQL, and PHP. I think that's right. It's uh, LIMP, L-E-M-P, uh, stands for Nginx. But the, uh, the framework itself or, or the, the server stack that makes up that web server, um, the language, uh, what, what uh, 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 engine you're using to call on your client versus server exchange, what you're dealing with, if you were to ever go into some of those uh, applications, you will see a uh, possibly a, a resource folder and a content folder and uh, uh, maybe a, a CSS folder, a JavaScript folder. Each one of these containers, uh, Shane, to your benefit, that doc, uh, document object model tree, they're going to have the same folder structure on the web server itself. So we, uh, I don't think we've talked about threading yet in our call. Uh, the last couple of sessions, we've gotten into reactive code. And uh, uh, Colin, you were uh, showcasing kind of the, the message call between the client and the server uh, whenever the, it fires the Shiny app back and forth. That threading or that exchange between your user interface, the client, and the server itself it's accessing all of those HTML resources and CSS resources and JavaScript resources. So in essence, the RStudio service is your uh, uh, analytics or, or your math uh, calculator. Shiny is the protocol translator that takes it from R into web development, okay? If we were to do uh, R markdown and then transpose through Pandoc into a PDF or an HTML file or some other uh, application, that protocol translation from one form of language to another form of language, that is exactly what Shiny is doing. Between the UI and the server, that's really what this application is doing. So entering into these different function calls or different uh, object calls, uh, dealing with the CSS itself, what we're doing is entering into the middle exchange, really uh, tampering with the... Uh, minutia of, of creating that web app. Um, Kevin, if you don't mind me uh, uh, asking, in your day-to-day uh, -day operation, uh, last week you were talking about testing code and document ing or, uh, uh, code ingestion, uh, data frame ingestion. Have you dealt with any of the theming or, or shiny side of, of your output? A little bit. But like you said, I just make sure it works first and then pretty later. Good point. Good point. Uh, and Martha, um, 
I, I, I know you just shut your camera off, but if you have the opportunity, have you in your experience dealt with uh, any web development in your past? No, 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 yet. No, okay, no. all right. Um, well, to, to everyone's benefit, I, I, I want to be a resource and, and help guide the team into kind of accessing this larger concept that may be foreign to you. Uh, if the entire book club is dedicated to Shiny as a service, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is kind of underneath this layer, right? It's almost kind of a precursor or a, a, a prerequisite to really comprehend what you're doing in Shiny. So this chapter is, is very, very, very vital uh, to our, our comprehension. All right, I answered everyone's question. Okay, so this first time I'm gonna, I'm gonna run this code that is creating this central limit theorem. And I have the web app, no, that's not it, that's not it. Where did it go? Let's go, no, it is off of here. So 6.3 and just reload app. Where did it go? Uh -uh. There it is, okay. So in your web browser, and, and this has been in the past chapters, we talk about textual input. So these are input calls where, where, where uh, the server itself is receiving information from the client uh, or the user interface directly. If I enter a different number and change, you'll notice that the main panel recalculates the presentation itself. Well, what you don't realize is this is actually a standard vectors graphic or an SVG output. Uh, we can do it in PNG, we can do it in bitmap and some other formats, but for the most part, uh, ggplot uh, or, or the, the grammar of graphics, they're going to render in standard vectors graphic, which is part of the HTML library, okay? You'll see SVG uh, oftentimes when you really start to get involved in downloading and, and processing these services. So for Shane's benefit and, and everyone else, uh, I'm going to go into developer tools. In most browsers, this is going to be the F12 key. Um, others may call it differently, but uh, Safari, Opera, uh, DuckDuckGo, uh, Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, Edge, all of them pretty much all rely on F12 as developer tools. Okay, so my current browser is Chrome. Uh, and what we're going to look at is the elements themselves. Now, this is, this is where things get really kind of, I encourage you to explore. I encourage you to, to kind of learn more. Go to a web page, click an object and say, inspect element, right? Go into your development tools and see what that element is doing. So let's talk about how this uh, uh, relates. So inside this uh, element, I've created my web server. I've got my client up and running. Uh, this is being presented uh, on port 8787. And then this is a unique identifier. We'll talk about IDs in a moment. But in relation, I've got these div tags. Well, hold on, before I even start there, let's talk about the preamble. Now you can open a text editor and create a preamble. It just starts with doc type and then whatever you wanna call it, XML, uh, SGML, uh, uh, HTML, right? This is called a preamble. It's always the first line of a, a, a uh, HTML file or a, a browser-based file. The next is going to be the next call, which is called an ATM, uh, HTML tag, right? In this, uh, in this case, we're calling it class. So this HTML tag, if I removed class, it would just uh, re resort there. The next is going to be head. Um, so you, you think of your body, you've got your head and your, your uh, uh, body itself. The, the brain is calling on all the sub uh, uh, threads or, or, or calls to other resources, JavaScript libraries, uh, CSS libraries, et cetera. Uh, think of it as the brain. And then the body is obviously what's doing all of the work. Okay, that's where all of your uh, H, uh, H1 tags and your uh, images and, and P tags, tables, all that kind of stuff's gonna live. Let me expand a little more. So I'm gonna expand body, excuse me, I'm gonna expand div tag. So notice that this is container fluid, right? Well, by design, this is, this is critical. If I go back to my RStudio server and I look, I'm calling on fluid page. Well, my container that I have here is called container fluid. That's the entire web page, right? So again, 
that's the parent, that's the uh, uh, canvas that I'm going to, to work with, my 12 columns of media, right? Let's expand this a little bit more. So now I've got div class row. Okay, well, row is going to be a, uh, horizontally uh, across the, the, the page itself. Um, let me double check. I don't want to claim that it goes on for infinity, uh, but let me let me let me test that theory. There's some frameworks that allow that to happen where you just scroll on forever. Okay, so I've got an H2 tag. H2 stands for heading two. Right. Well, we didn't call that. Excuse me. Sorry, team. We didn't call heading two directly from our our script. However. The title panel automatically called or created an H2 tag with the title, excuse me, central limit theorem. Okay, so let's go back to our dev tools. We see that we have an H2 tag containing central, uh, central limit theorem. Now, I don't know if this will work, but let me just try. Sometimes you can get this to recreate. Yep, okay. Now that doesn't change the R Studio. That's only in cached memory. It's not persistent. Right? If I hit refresh, it's going to go back to a lowercase L. But what I just did was I entered that object, that heading to object, and then I changed the text inside that container. All right, let's keep going. So the next row is going to be column small four. Uh, SM SM. Uh, let me double check that, but. Um, we're we're looking at a uh, a dimension of four columns width, right? The other is going to be eight columns width, right? Four plus eight equals twelve. So just always remember that. Okay. And then the last, go ahead. Quick question on that, Ryan. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was actually going to ask this before. When you've got a standard um, like panel layout like this, where you've got your side panel and your main panel, um, are those the defaults for an eight for your your side panel width and your? Not necessarily. Uh, so yeah. I don't, let's. And, and the, I guess the follow-up is, is there a way to pass an argument to dictate those or would you just nest a column function within the panel, I guess? We're, we're going to find that in the RStudio call or the UI call, when we, when we instantiate or create that object that is the uh, side panel container, uh, you can pass uh, information that says, I want this to be in, you know, uh, columns 11 and 12. So that pushes it cool. to the right side of the panel instead. Yeah, there is ways that you can manipulate. Uh, and then as it goes through that run app compiler, it would generate uh, the the HTML output or CSS output that coincides. Good okay, question cool. though. Yep, yep. Um, what I wanted to do is change my size real quick. So this is called dynamic. Uh, this started with HTML5. Um, again, if we don't have a lot of frequency with HTML developers, uh, this may probably not mean anything to you. Uh, but old school was HTML1, then it went to two and three, uh, created four, and then eventually I think it was in 2017, 2016, uh, there was a big push or a big movement from the uh, Worldwide Consortium uh, to evoke a lot more tagging or processing in the document object model. Uh, and so that now became a, a, a uh, dynamic environment. So that gave spawn to uh, cascading style sheets, 2.0, 3.0, uh, SCSS, and SAS. Okay. There's other ways or other libraries that extended this into the future of, of how the web interface works. Okay. Um, not getting too far off the beaten path here, but uh, what I wanted to do is just change my browser size and then see if that dynamic call uh, uh, manipulated. I don't think it will. I'm pretty sure gotcha. it won't. Yeah, it's still going to be four and eight. Uh, it's just the amount of pixels that you have within those columns has been reduced, right? Sure. So, all right, uh, let's expand that back to full screen. I'm not going too fast for anybody, am I? I don't want anybody to feel left out, or if you have questions, please don't uh, worry about interrupting me. Uh, that's okay. Um, so the thought of container is the key here. Uh, a container is a box. A container is a object. A container is something that I can put content into. Now, in the, the current Shiny app book, we haven't extended into uh, package management or 
or develop it into apps, et cetera. But um, when we get into modularization, right, making these into smaller uh, consumable items, think of that container as being that thought. So I've got a div class. Uh, uh, the class is form group shiny input container. Give me a second and I'll, I'll explain what a class is in relation to what this tag means. But a div tag is almost like a uh, uh, differentiation. It's, it's not following the CSS directly. Uh, it's kind of like a separate call in the threading to the, to the graphics processor unit and to the CSS. So instead of being a, uh, uh, just a, a regular P tag or, a, or a, an attribute tag or whatever tag we want to call it, we're using this special container called div, right? Always remember, it's just a unique identifier and, and web development is very verbose. If it doesn't fit, if it doesn't work, it's not going to render. Okay. So if you go in and start to manipulate these things, just remember if it doesn't uh, paint on the screen properly, go into your, your console and see what errors you're getting uh, from the uh, application. Okay, let's expand this out. Okay, so this is form group shiny input container. Uh, th the control label is number of samples and that coincides with what we've called it up here. If I go back to our RStudio, no, that's not it, this one. Um, in the call to that tag, this numeric input, uh, we're passing the name of the title as number of samples. Okay. Well, again, in that compiling process, the HTML output is creating this uh, 4M. I have to figure out what that implies. Uh, but ultimately, it's a label, and it's called number of sam samples with the colon. Okay. So do you, do you kind of understand, or, or, or am I hopefully painting the right picture for you that in the RStudio language of Shiny package, when I call a container, a side panel, a, a side object slider, whatever the case is, and then I'm telling it, I want you to be this many numbers, I want you to have uh, this title uh, or maybe a, a text entry point of what it is, right? There is a reason why you're doing that from R, RStudio as Shiny apps uh, builds or creates your HTML and CSS and, and JavaScript uh, tagging, the bootstrap and, and, and Shiny as a service is allowing for that protocol translation. Okay, It's creating that doc document object model or that server itself. Okay, All right. Um, obviously, uh, the default value is two. Uh, the minimum value that I'm entering is one and the maximum value is 100. Well, let's go double check that just to make sure that we did enter that properly. And again, team, I'm just copying and pasting from the textbook, so I'm not creating this myself. Uh, but we can confirm, yes, the number we're passing is two, the default value two, the minimum value that we will accept is one, and the maximum value is 100. Well, what if I change that? Again, what it, literally, what if I change it? And I bet you this will break something, so let's just try it for uh, purposes of learning. Let's just change this to 50, right? So in the document object model, in this cached memory, I'm changing the tag of that input label, okay? Now, our studio and the server is expecting the user interface is, is calling it as 100, but I just modified it inside the document object model. Let's see if it works. So I'm gonna put in 75. And so there it is. Value must be less than or equal to 50. Okay, now what, watch this. This is where it's kind of mind blowing, right? This is cached memory. It's not persistent. It's not part of the script. So if I refresh my browser, okay, it's going to go back to 100 because that's what the server has or that's what the, the, the script, the UI has. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Ryan, I got a quick this, question for you. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, I've noticed that on the line that you have highlighted there, it says class equals form control shiny bound input. And um, with that, what I'm guessing, and, and this is my question, is somehow your browser here, Chrome, does it automatically understand what a shiny bound input is? Like somehow Chrome must know to draw this in the, you know, in the style of R and the style of shiny. Whereas maybe if we had, if we had been working not in R, but in some of them, say Python or something, then, 
then that would transfer over as like form control Python bound input or something, which tells me I, that the, the browser has to know has to know all these different kinds of program bound inputs, or yes. maybe it gets told at the time that it gets sent over. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change your language just slightly, Ryan. Yeah. So yes, I'm using Chrome at the moment. Okay, but if I were in Internet Explorer, if I were in uh, Firefox, if I were in Safari, right, what I want you to think in your mind is don't get so caught up in the, uh, I guess, the vendor of the browser. Mm -hmm. Think of it as the document object model, the DOM itself, okay, because that is so integral to the comprehension of what's going on here. The document object model, regardless of if it's from Google Chrome, if it's from you know, Mozilla Firefox, you know, Microsoft Edge or, or Internet Explorer, the document object model is this common language between server and client, right? Um, if you've probably possibly had in the past where a developer or a, a, an IT person says, oh, by the way, you have to use Internet Explorer uh, to interact with my server, right? If you use any other browser, it's not gonna work. Well, that's because of the language or the protocols that they have. And I'll, I'll try and find a good web page. There's a wiki page that is related to uh, different uh, 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 versions of a browser, the history of it. Like you can't use Internet Explorer 6 anymore because there's no server that will run it, right? Plus it's easily hackable. Um, but the, uh, the, the, so changing your question, I would say, instead of using Chrome as a service, I would say, either call it the browser or the, the document object model because that's agnostic to the operating system and to the, to the uh, uh, vendor, okay. right? This is just HTML, okay. So then the next thing, and I'm gonna use you as a segue to answer your question. Whenever you see the word class, okay, just like in CSS, just like in Java, just like in other programming languages, a class call is something unique. We're telling it, go, follow this uh, language or this uh, attribute uh, surrounding that variable, right? Give it, some, give it some characteristics, okay? Well, the class call in a document object model is to the CSS. So in, in our elements, uh, is it elements? Sources, sources. This is a little bit difficult to find, so uh, I'm gonna hope to uh, do this quickly, I hope. If I look at shiny.css, Okay. Now, I didn't create this. This is part of that shiny web app compiler that created this file, CSS file. Uh, CSS stands for cascading style sheet. How you want to approach the concepts here is that HTML is your text. CSS is how that text is going to look and feel. JavaScript is your interactive media. And then obviously different raster images or vector graphics images uh, is, is the presentation style. Okay. So uh, cascading style sheet is, is critical. And if I do a control F, let's go find out what that term was. We're going to say it's form control. So sources, control F. Did I do that? Yes, fine. Form underscore control. That? No. Now I'm looking foolish. Class form control. Let's try shiny bound input and see if that does it. Yep, there it is. Uh, input. No, it doesn't like input, huh? Well, I think it answers my question, though. It, it, yeah, uh, it's not that the it's not that the browser itself automatically knows every single. Uh, input style and every single output style yeah. that exists, you, you provide that to it in the form of a CSS sheet. And then, um, and, and, and then at the time that it actually needs a version of this input, then it can refer to whatever reference you provided. Yeah, so it, 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 it you, go ahead, Shane. I, I was just gonna say, I think we might be getting an equivalent of what we were looking for that that form class with that uh, that period before it with that CSS selector that shorthand. I'm wondering yes. if that's basically just like abbreviating well, it's, that. Yeah, it's it's giving uh, it's giving credentials or giving uh, the uh, the look and feel of that particular object, right? So, uh, or I don't want to use the word container, but it's a tag. Uh, this particular tag I'm using is uh, IDM type is number, uh, class form control, shiny bound input. Um, 
each one of those particular attributes would be in relation to a call to the CSS or a call to a JavaScript. Everything has an ID, everything has a unique identifier to link all of this together. Now, team, what is blowing your mind, or at least I hope that it's, it's uh, being important here, HTML is extremely verbose. It either works or it doesn't work. There's no option in between. I have had so many different uh, uh, funny, funny, funny conversations. My wife just the other day uh, was showing me her phone and she goes, I don't know why this Kirkland app is not working properly. She goes, I can see all of the uh, tagging, but there's no like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the different colors and the theming that goes along with that web page. And I said, I guarantee that it's just a crappy server, uh, whether it be Nginx or Apache, Somewhere along the lines, that call between the web server and her phone, the client, the object, uh, is not exchanging information properly or it's not able to render it properly. So therefore, the CSS more than likely was broken. Somewhere along that threading, somewhere along that exchange, the CSS wasn't making it to the phone or it wasn't able to render properly. So, so, so you, for example, when you copy paste this URL to another browser, yes. it carries with it all this information. Uh, no, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's a great question, Martha. What I would say is that it's coming from the server. So your document object model, this, this threading that I'm referring to is just a, a transmit and receive exchange. So the client, your computer is requesting from the server, I need all this information to render this web page. And that's part of the TCP IP stack. It's part of how server client exchange works, um, the protocols, et cetera, et cetera, HTTP, hypertext uh, transfer protocol. Your server is going, or sorry, your, yeah, your server is going to obviously serve up that information. Your client is going to consume it. Your document object model is going to consume it and then render that page. Um, that's why I was telling Ryan uh, only slightly modifying the terms that he was using uh, to be in more of a uh, web mindset or, or two-part exchange type mindset. Correct. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Let's, let's do that real quick, Martha, just to, uh, to uh, double check. Uh, I don't use Safari very often on this computer, so let's open that. Yeah, I don't know what web... Works, but I, I was just thinking through yeah. when we have to explain in this. Uh, let's see. Nope. Uh, I don't uh, I don't remember my credentials here. Uh, yeah, sure. I don't care. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Um, what is? But for my end, the 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 app was local. It was not on the cloud, so I don't. Uh, correct. Yeah. Well, so so the question you may be asking is, where does the server live? Well, in this case, it's just my computer. I've got uh, a, a application that's running on the, the local machine and, and serving up uh, the information on a local network. Um, or if my namespace variable may be someplace out in the ether, right? Some Amazon web service or some other uh, 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 odd uh, country or, or, or origin of where the information is arriving. Um, that's called your, your namespace variable. Um, it has to do with the URL itself or the uh, domain network uh, resolution. Again, this kind of spins off into another topic in general, but the easiest way to remember though is in this case, uh, you've got your local server and then your user input client. Uh, and right now for most of our Teams uh, use of Shiny, uh, it's just local to your machine. But if you were to host it or upload the code to like Shiny IO, uh, Kevin talks about Shiny IO quite a bit. Um, it's a good, good uh, uh, source. If you were to upload that code, now the Shiny IO is your web server. Well, I don't know where it lives. It's not really important. I don't need to know that. When I point my computer at that, that domain or that, that web call, I'm gonna make that connection, that linkage. Okay. All right. Um, I apologize. I know I, I sound like I'm chatterboxing like crazy, but there's so, 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 so much to this chapter that's awesome. Um, it really uh, provides the user a kind of, I don't know, um, I, I, I felt very limited in the few pages that were offered in the book uh, because this topic just kind of goes off forever. Uh, you really can never finish really learning all of this media. Okay.
All right, let's let's uh, come back. Um, I was trying to open the Safari browser and it wasn't playing nice with me. So um, go back to Chrome. Uh, Ryan, I was able to answer your question about the CSS. Martha, you were talking about where does this information come from? Okay. Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Well, let me let me interject just for a second, real quick, Ryan. So um, I wanted to just make sure that uh, that we um, try to keep it as close to an hour. Now I'm, I have a sense that we probably haven't gotten to everything that you wanted to cover, and I absolutely want to hear it all. I have learned okay. a ton. Um, so I guess I would just say right now we've got ten minutes or so. Um, if anybody needs to drop off right at the hour, feel free. And then, um, you know, we'll just kind of wrap up whenever you, whenever you get to it, Ryan. And if you want to carry over into next week, by all means, I, I think that'd be super helpful. So, well, I think what would be most beneficial, I, I the, the, the next really big section here, I can kind of glaze over. I've spent enough time talking about these different objects. Everyone uh, recognizes or comprehends how to actually make these calls. All right. So if we create a container in this next example, uh, we have a fluid page and then we're calling another subset or child of that fluid page called fluid row. Inside that fluid row, now I'm going to add some objects. And in this case, I'm selling the column. Uh, I want to take up four columns and then the other, I'm going to take up eight columns. Uh, Shane, this kind of goes to your question on the, the numbering sequence. Again, team, the most important Take away from this is it always adds up to 12. The bootstrap object always adds up to 12. The next is I'm creating an, a second fluid row. And in that case, I'm creating another six columns of dedicated object. And then I have another six columns. So here I'm going to literally split my page in half. Okay. All right. Now the exercise, Colin, uh, I, I, I feel that your question or comment is near and dear to my heart. And I do want to uh, uh, satisfy the entire team's discussion about these exercises. So the first uh, question says, read the documentation for sidebar layout. To determine the width in columns of the sidebar in the main panel, can you recreate its appearance using a fluid row and a column? What are missing? Well, what's missing in this is going to be the number. You have to pass it the size of that fluid row column. All right, how many columns am I going to take up? Oh, well, I could have a total of 12 columns if I wanted to, right? Um, the next question says, modify the central limit theorem app to put the sidebar on the right instead of the left. Well, in this case, I would probably call on fluid row, right? So change the, the theorem app script, uh, go back to the top here. Instead of calling a sidebar layout only, I would put the sidebar layout inside a fluid row, right? So I would go up one level of hierarchy, contain that in a fluid row, and then specify the column that contains our sidebar panel would be, I don't know, column nine, right? So it's going to shove it all the way to the right. Make sense? Okay. Um, and I, I don't, I didn't have an example of this. I apologize. I didn't create that but I did want to satisfy the exercises Colin uh, had asked about that at a, at a side conversation. Uh, the third says create an app with, that contains two plots, each of which takes up half of the width. Uh, put the controls in the full width container below the plots. Okay, so really what it's asking for is a three object page. I would split my first two fluid rows, maybe as my main objects, uh, main object one, main object two, and, and I would put those as uh, uh, numbers six so that I take up half and half. And then at the bottom, I would create a well and push the, the remaining third object to the bottom of my page. Okay. All right. So that's multi-page layouts. Um, we're getting into uh, some text surrounding um, the uh, tab panels and, and navigation bars. So I'm going to quickly scroll down here. Ryan, to your benefit, what I'm actually trying to get to is the theming piece of this puzzle. And we're going to watch my server crash. You'll, you'll watch as this thing uh, uh, crashes on me. But when we are discussing uh, different tabs, these aren't your browser tab. Don't confuse yourself with what we're doing here. Excuse me, let me pull this, yeah, minimize that. Get it out of the way so I can show you what I'm referring to. We're not talking about these tabs, all right? 
we're going to be referring to the tabs of our application itself, right? So let's go render, uh, is that exercise 6.6, I believe. Uh, let's go up to, I was in a different weird area here. Uh, theme objects 6.6, 6.6, it's already open. Let's run that out. Now it may beef at me because I already had the app running. So let's close that and then try to run it again. Yeah. That's the browser. Now, if I were to uh, open up development, development tools here, I can assure you that I'm going to have an object called tab, right? And that's these particular tabs we're referring to. As the user is interacting with the uh, document object model, we're selecting these different tabs. It's sending to the server, hey, change the page, uh, or, or, or maybe it's in cached memory and the, and the browser is, is creating that uh, different call, okay? And I can zoom in closer if that is probably hard to see for the team, uh, too close, too close. So when I select panel one, you can see that the kernel, uh, current panel is number one. If I select two and I select three, uh, this would be important uh, when we are presenting so much information to our user within the Shiny app window that we may have to delineate or separate this into different uh, interactive points. Um, Kevin, do you want to allude to this? Because I'm almost banking that this is probably where you live at currently. I love tab panels. <laughs> you do? OK, all yes. right. Uh, do you use the navigation bar at all? The navigation panel? That's going to be... I, I mostly use uh, dashboard frameworks. Okay. Uh, BS4 Dash is my is my go-to. <laughs> so I, I actually have to point. start using different layouts just to get some experience, but I love the BS4 Dash um, framework uh, package. Good point, sir. Well, and that's the that's the beauty of this right now is is in the document itself or or the the book club itself. As we learn and grow using these particular tools, uh, rely on on ourselves to help navigate. Uh, whether that be the Slack channel, um, I know Tan has has been very uh, vocal in answering a lot of questions. Uh, uh, Ken, uh, I don't. Ken is in the GG Plot book club at the moment but uh, he seems to answer a lot of questions as well. But, all right, uh, let's go to app 6.7. In this case, I'm, I'm creating a, uh, a navigation bar. Uh, so the only thing that's different between the two is instead of calling a tab a panel, I called a nav panel instead. That's the only difference. But what we're, what we're, what we're doing here, zoom in again, sorry team, is as I select my different panels, you can see the change of uh, panel contents two, uh, panel contents three. So the main object is a child of these different navigation tabs, right? I'm creating like a, a multi-dimensional pathway for my user uh, to help navigate into additional information that I wanna express to them, right? Okay, let's go back. So Ryan. Um... Good, sir. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off by any means, but um, we're right at this, we are at the seven o'clock, and and um, I see that okay. Shane already dropped out, and I want to make sure that okay. um, we we you know we 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 cover the information that we can, um, and then save it for another session. So um, I think this would be a good stopping point, don't you, Ryan? The other Ryan? Excellent. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I was going to ask how much, uh, what, how much time do you think you need for next week? I Which would is say a, it's not a suggestion to cut it short. <laughs> Just no. uh, if you need the whole session, by all means. I would, I would say maybe ten minutes. Um, what, what is going to happen after this section? It will talk about the bootstrap theme or BS lib. Um, that's actually funny, and that's why I told Colin that my web server version of our studio is is or it's not allowing me. Um, I do have my desktop app, but uh, unfortunately, this thing I guarantee will crash on me. What mm -hmm. uh, I would say ten minutes tops, uh, but I would like to extend or explore into that BS lib package. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. If we are all in a learning phase, um, I would only caution a person not to get too far off the beaten path early. Uh, stick with a working app 
then you can start becoming a little bit more eloquent with our, our theming. So. Cool. I, I think, I think this will also give you an opportunity to, you know, get everything working that you want to share with us. So I think this yeah, is a great yeah. stopping point. Yeah. Um, and I, I really wanted to dive into bootstrap. I, I saw what, it, what the book covered, but I feel like there's just tons and tons to learn there. So um, it's infinite. Yeah. Yeah. So um, take as much time as you need for next week. Um, I was going to handle chapter seven, so I'll be ready to start talking about chapter seven. But um, but if if our if bootstrap and what you have left takes the whole hour, I mean, I don't have a problem pushing it for another week. Um, I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want it to extend that far. Um, you're getting into graphics, right? So uh, Ryan, your section is probably going to talk about images and kind of what the the main plot looks like or or, or rendering, correct? Yeah, and I think you're also overestimating what I'm going to be able to present. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what it'll be. And so anyway, I, we'll maybe we just, uh, yeah, we just pick it up next week and we'll just see how it goes. And we'll have a few people ready to talk about different things and people will, will be able to answer questions, I'm sure. So Awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, for my part, thank you, Ryan. This was incredibly informative. I feel uh, like I've learned a ton. Good. So. Good. Yeah. That was great. Uh, I'm Opening up in the, the console and the web developer tool. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. It is. Uh, well, it's it's a it's a hidden gem that users don't often know about, and and it's taken me quite a while. And I'm not an expert. Don't don't. Uh, uh, point of me is knowing everything about it, but there's a lot of information there that, that we as developers using this uh, uh, browser can really start to, to exercise with. Yeah. Excellent. So again, I, yeah, I really appreciate your time, Ryan, and I really appreciate you putting this together because this is a lot, this is a lot of really good information. So good. I guess Excellent. we'll, we'll call it for tonight. And then I, I look forward to seeing everybody next week. See you. Thanks everybody. Awesome, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Oops.